In 1.35, the Ottomans are getting an absolutely massive rework, and today we're going to be talking about it. Not only will the Ottomans be very different to play as, but they will also be incredibly different to play against. Today we're going to be talking about the Dev Diary going over the Ottomans in the 1.35 patch coming up. In the beginning here, Tinto has talked about some things that they wanted to change, things that they've learned about from previous patches. Here they're talking about the gimmick of branching missions and how they're good to use, but when they're being overused, it can uh, kind of be a little bit uh, confusing and it's also kind of hard on the game engine. A little bit about the Livonian government reform that is evolving. A lot of people don't even know about it, but essentially what they say is that in the future, if they're going to do it, they're going to have them be different tiers rather than just one tier one reform that just changes up based on decisions and whatnot. They said that previous immersion packs and DLC focus way too much on missions, and uh, while they don't plan to add a whole lot of mechanics, they definitely want to diversify the content and uh, kind of broaden out the scope to what these things are coming, which I'm not going to complain about. A lot of people complain that the immersion packs are just, you know, a DLC for missions, which I think has a little bit of an argument to it. But uh, in the future, they're going to be adding a couple more things to try to make things a little more interesting, specifically focusing on encouraging unique play styles. Here, they're talking about the Ottomans and their very divisive nature here within the EU4 community. Some view them as an unstoppable juggernaut that really just kind of ruins the mid game for a lot of people. Some people argue that uh, they're not strong enough and that in the late game, they just crumble and there is not really a final boss that uh, they are kind of looking for for their uh, you know higher skill cap players so what they're going to be doing is uh, they are going to be introducing quite a few changes starting off with a mission tree here and you can see it is quite big and anybody who's played flavor universalis will probably notice quite a bit of a correlation between this one and the ottoman tree which is actually i believe the last mission tree that big boss uh, released before he went over to tinto if this is anywhere similar to flavor universalis's ottomans i'm a fan a big fan. Of course, a lot of dev art, and it says right here, be aware, is very much a work in progress, so nothing is final. So if you have some feedback, make sure you head on over to the forum post and uh, leave a comment and let the devs know what you think about it. Some nice flavor for the Ottomans to begin their game. Of course, the guns of Urban have to make their appearance, and you can even get cannons in the early game before you unlock them to use on sieges, which is really, really cool. That's something that you've never seen in the game, at least I don't think it exists in base game. So that's a really cool thing. Of course, since you haven't unlocked them, you can only use them for sieges, but still very useful, especially early game. Imagine sieging down a capital fort with three cannons in 1444. That's pretty sweet. Of course, more flavor events around Constantinople. There are missions that will branch into different directions, allowing you to push for the true Roman empire. And you can even move your capital to Rome very interesting along with that path you will get an interesting name change but one of the more interesting things that i'm seeing here is uh the new kind of overlord ottomans play style that is going to be available to you you can see here that they are going to be turning wallachia into an islet which is essentially a semi-autonomous subject that they can integrate over time and so they reap some benefits from having them as a subject but not quite as much as having them as say a personal union or a direct vassal and you can see a couple new diplomatic actions uh, associated with these islet subjects a lot of people complain that eu4 doesn't kind of historically simulate the uh, interaction between the ottomans and the mamluks and uh you will now be able to for those who do not know the ottomans actually kind of like full annex the mamluks in one or two major wars over the course of a few years obviously in eu4 the mechanics of the game do not allow that but there will be a new mechanic here introduced that will allow it to happen which will lead to some interesting event chains and eventually ending in uh, a subjugation of the mamluk sultanate complete with a formation of i think the egypt tag with a new name. Of course, they won't be as efficient as the other subjects because they are big and farther away from Constantinople. And of course, you don't have to take any of these islets at all. You can conquer the land outright if that is your play style. Not a single islet will be required to play the game at all. A base second Islamic golden age, allowing every Muslim nation to have a second golden age or extend their current golden age. That's pretty good. After the mission tree and the events associated with a lot of that, we have a new estate for the Ottomans, the Janissaries, complete with a ton of new privileges that uh, can either make or break a nation. Essentially, they can be incredibly powerful early. They can give you a ton of bonuses, but in the late game, you're clearly going to run into some issues. Anybody who knows anything about the real life Ottoman Empire know that the Janissaries led to a uh, a few problems for the country. Just to look at a few here, you can see army tradition, stab cost, land maintenance, discipline, reinforcement, all these things for the Janissaries. But the Janissaries can uh, get a little bit uppity and uh, start demanding privileges, which will obviously lead to a bit of unrest within your nation. And now it's time for a new mechanic, the Ottoman decadence mechanic, which I think is going to be very interesting and uh, hopefully very moddable. Essentially, when the decadence bar fills up, the Ottomans will be hit with um, a few negative modifiers. You can see stab, forget about it. Tech, forget about it. Loyal subjects, 
forget about it. But the major thing is, is that this internal power struggle disaster will almost certainly fire if Decadence gets maxed out. And it is going to lead to a cascade of events that will absolutely destroy the Ottomans or allow them to become you know, once again, the most powerful nation in the world. There are a few extra disasters and we're gonna talk about each of them. The Ayalet Rebellion is what it sounds like. You will become less stable and your subjects will gain a little bit of liberty desire and a few events tied to it, which will spawn pretender rebels, give more subjects liberty desire and uh, will cost some money as well and fund a little bit of their rebellions. The Pasha Decadence disaster, which uh, clearly is a bad thing because if you guys don't know, the Pashas were kind of like the local governors within the Ottoman Empire. Clearly, if your various provinces are rebelling, you are going to lose some stability and you are going to have people who are vying for that power. As expected, lots and lots of separatists with these ones. The plot of the harem, which is an internal struggle between the harem and the advisors of the Sultan and the Sultan himself. Pretenders will rise, heirs will be assassinated, and uh, advisors are gonna get thrown out windows. Last but not least, the Janissary coup, and anybody who has watched my channel for any meaningful amount of time will probably know how I feel about the Janissary coup specifically the flavor universalis one uh, made me question every decision that I've ever made in my life but yes the Janissary coup is a vanilla disaster that has been incorporated into this disaster chain essentially the Janissaries are going to uh you know take over and they are going to cause a little bit of ruckus within the country and you can choose to either face them or negotiate with them if you face them you're going to have to deal with uh some issues and the devs were pretty quick to say these numbers are not final it'll probably be much less in the actual uh, live version that gets shipped to the players but via negotiation you will be able to revoke their privileges and if you can revoke them you will get the mensor army reform which is quite powerful uh notably giving you western technology which actually kind of curbs the issue that ottomans usually run into in the late game being weak because anatolian units very strong early game fairly weak in the late game. Western units are okay in the early game and are very strong in the late game. So a very, very big buff and a 10% discipline for the rest of the game, which is insane. But you can't recruit Janissaries anymore. So, you know, you take the good with the bad. On the flip side, you can compromise with the Janissaries and reincorporate them into the army, which gives some very serious buffs to the Janissaries, but uh, obviously you don't get those Mansour army reforms and you stay with the Anatolian units. So. It's up to you how you go. Both seem viable, but honestly, I think I would have to go with the Western units. The Dev Sherma system, which is a base game decision that you can take, is now being incorporated into government reforms. It enables the Dev Sherma mechanic ability, which is a good old fashioned three button mechanic in your government tab, kind of like ICTA or Feudal Theocracy. You can see here, it gives some solid bonuses to unrest reduction, advisors, and uh, military bonuses as well. Of course, there's tons of flavor events like uh, Sieging Down Vienna. And uh, if you can make that happen, I think uh, the rest of Europe will be quite shaken up about this. Uh, every Christian in Germany, as well as Italy, will receive this event upon your sieging of Vienna. The end is nigh. May the Lord have mercy upon our souls. You can also subjugate Austria and turn them into one of your special units very based and plenty more flavor events, uh, getting women in the government, getting epic generals and admirals, expansion of the imperial bureaucracy, which will lead to decreased core creation costs and governing capacity, which is uh, pretty useful if you're playing a nation like the Ottomans. Of course, you know, Tinto's got to give a shout out to Suleiman the Magnificent, a very legendary leader of the Ottoman Empire, a 656 in the game age 15, so uh, that's a pretty good one to have. A new unique naval doctrine for all Turkish nations giving bonuses to force limit and ship cost, which is uh, already very strong considering the fact that the Ottomans usually have like 15 to 20 galleys in the early game. Now they're gonna have 20% more. And some good news for those who like to play the Ruman Empire. Uh, actually, they will not have the government of the Ottoman reform anymore. They will get their new unique Sultanate, which enables the Dev Shermim system, but disables the decadence mechanics so they don't have to deal with those events. And of course, the cute little Balix will get their own reform as well. Next week, we're gonna be talking Far East Asia, which is pretty sweet. And I'm curious what you guys read today that uh, gets you the most excited. Questions, concerns, leave them in the comments below. And if you like me reading through the Dev Diary with you, make sure you let me know in the comments as well. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more. And a huge shout out to the patrons who keep the channel going, get early access to videos and exclusive Discord benefits using the link in the description. I hope you have a wonderful day and until next time, stay chill.